Good morning, everyone, from Ford City, Pennsylvania. This is Chuck King on Saturday, October 23rd, 2021, bringing you a morning Bible study. And we've been studying the messages and the methods of the first century apostles as they preached the gospel and obedience to the Great Commission and to the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to look at Acts 17 today, beginning at verse 1. And when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. So we have this apostolic team going to Thessalonica, and it was their custom. They started out in the synagogue of the Jews, where they knew the people were already aware of the Old Testament scriptures. And uh, you can see here that he took three different Sabbaths and and taught them and preached to them about Jesus. And it, what, what was the content? According to the, verse 2, he used the scripture, meaning the Old Testament scripture, to demonstrate that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead and proving and persuading them that Jesus is the Messiah. And as always, some people are persuaded, and obviously most of the people don't receive the message, but there were some that were were persuaded. And a lot of of these devout Greeks, they would be the proselytes or the God-fearing Gentiles that had, had attached themselves to the synagogue, but were not full, fully accepted or full-fledged Jewish members. And they believed the gospel and uh, quite a few of the leading women. So there was a move of God here in Thessalonica to bring in a harvest of new disciples. Verse 5. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. They must have been meeting in a house church meeting there in Jason's house. And the Jews, because of jealousy, those who had rejected the word, they gathered us, evil men and a mob and attacked that house where the disciples were meeting. Verse 6, But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. So they went to Jason's house where the disciples had been meeting in a house church meeting and dragged them out. Jason and some some of the brethren were there, not everyone. And they were accused before the authorities uh, as the men, the men who have turned the world upside down. Very famous quote in verse 6, turned the world upside down. This means that everything that the world does and its, its natural worldly wisdom is the opposite of the kingdom of God. And when the message of the gospel 
and the kingdom of God is preached, it ends up turning everything upside down from the rule of the God of this world, the little g God of this world, and the, the, the evil powers of darkness to the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. And it's totally opposite. And uh, this is what we're talking about. And so they finally let them go after getting some kind of bond or it says security here. Verse 10. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. So this is what Jesus taught them to do. If they're persecuted in one city, flee to another. And so they got Paul and Silas away from there, the, the, these apostles, and sent them to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Same pattern of ministry. Find the synagogue and begin persuading those Jews to believe in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Verse 11, these were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. So they were students of the word of God and were open and willing to hear the message of the gospel and wanted to find out whether the scriptures confirmed what Paul and Silas were teaching them. Verse 12, Therefore many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. So there were many people who responded to the gospel in, Thessalon or in Berea. And um, again, it mentions the Greeks. These would have been the, the proselytes, the Gentiles who had attached themselves to the synagogue. And also the women are mentioned as well as the men. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica, you see the previous town where they had been persecuted, learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea. They came there also and stirred up the crowd. So the, the devil used people to cause persecution to come upon the apostles. And this is what Paul was promised from the beginning. He knew it was coming. And literally everywhere he went, the devil stirred up the people to persecute him. And this was, this was what he was told that this thorn of the flesh, which manifested itself in all kinds of persecution and trials, is what Paul would face everywhere, and he surely did. Verse 14, Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea, but both Silas and Timothy remained there. So they sent Paul away, but Silas and Timothy stayed to continue their ministry for a time there in Berea. Verse 14, 15. So those who conducted Paul brought them to Athens and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. So the team is splitting up here. Paul's going to Athens and he's going to wait for Timothy and Silas to join him there. So you see how they worked. They worked out of the synagogues proclaimed the gospel, exalted Jesus as the Christ, and then looked for the fruit of repentance and faith, the grace of God working in those who heard. And then they would take those disciples and begin to work with them, even while they shook the dust off from the, those who rejected the unbelieving people. This was the way the apostles functioned. They didn't stay and keep trying to argue and debate with those who rejected, but they focused their attention on making disciples and bringing those new believers into, uh, into the foundations of the faith and eventually into maturity in Christ. Verse 16, Now when Paul, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked, within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Do you remember when that slave girl was prophesying about 
uh, Paul and Silas in Philippi, he had the similar reaction. He was provoked by that in, in his spirit. He, he knew that the Holy Spirit was showing him this was wrong. And he was here, here in Athens. He was very upset over the idolatry. Verse 17, therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So Paul again went to the synagogue to reach the Jews and the proselytes or the God-fearing Gentiles who had attached themselves to the, the synagogue. He ministered to them, but also he went daily to the actual marketplace to, to start persuading anyone who was there to preach the gospel to them. Verse 18, then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him and some said, what does this babbler want to say? So these philosophers were inquiring about what Paul's message was. Others said he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. So this is a place where idolatry was practiced and they simply thought that Paul was preaching about additional gods and they had embraced idols so this was nothing unusual for them they thought this was someone coming from a foreign country proclaiming other idols verse 10 and they took him and brought him to the areopagus saying may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak so they took him to this famous place the Areop areopagus to where they had they had debates and discussions. Verse 20, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. So they were inquiring about this new teaching from Paul concerning Jesus. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. So they were always looking for the latest news, something new, inquiring, you know, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They wanted to know more and more. And so they wanted to hear the gospel at this time. This place, the Areopagus, by the way, uh, the ruins of it still exist there. In fact, my son and his, his wife were just there on their honeymoon and send picture back of this very the ruins of this building where Paul met with these people verse 22 then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said men of Athens I perceive that in all things you are very religious for as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. So Paul uses the, the tactic of, of their own, uh, using their own idolatrous worship to try to persuade them to believe in Jesus by pointing out their religion. By the way, religion is a, is a terrible thing. You can see it here. It's manifested in idolatry devotion to religious practices doesn't save a person it binds them up in in error and he he saw this altar that was dedicated to the unknown god and so because they didn't know jesus he used this opportunity to preach the gospel verse 24 god who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times 
and boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So Paul Paul preaches about the one true God, creator of heaven and earth, to these pagan idolaters, and clearly reveals to them that God doesn't dwell in these religious temples they've built, and he doesn't receive their religious worship. You know, I've been to the pagan country since they even bring offerings of food to these dumb idols and lay trays of food before them on a regular basis. This is the ignorance of idolatry and dead religion. But he, pre- he preaches to them the one true God who made all men and, and determined where they live and how they live in hope that they would seek him as creator, seek the Lord and find him. When you seek him, you find him. This is the principle of, of the word of God, of God's revelation. If you seek the Lord, you will find him. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. This is true throughout the entire Bible. And he is our life. He, Paul was teaching that. For in him we live and move and have our being. He even quoted one of their poets as saying that we are the one true God's offspring. Verse 29, therefore, since we are the offspring of God, the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. So it's not through idolatry and making of idols and images that demonstrates the divinity of God. That's foolishness. Verse 30, truly these times of ignorance, uh, uh, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So Paul is revealing the need for repentance, turning to God, changing your thinking to believe the word of God, changing your behavior to obey the word of God. That's what repentance really is. Verse 31, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, Jesus, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead, the resurrection of of Jesus Christ. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again in this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, Some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius, the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. So there was only a few, there were only a few who believed after Paul preached in the Areopagus. They were a culture steeped in idolatry and ignorance, and most of them resisted the gospel, and very similar to what we have today in our idolatrous culture where people seek everything as their source of religion except the truth of the gospel. So there we have it, Acts 17, and how the apostles ministered and preached even among the idolatrous pagans as well as the Old Testament Jewish people. And they always proclaimed Jesus Christ as the Messiah who died for the sins of the world and rose again for our redemption. And we ought to apply these principles in all of our ministries and in all of our churches where we are burdened to reach those who receive the gospel, who become disciples, who who are willing to be transformed by the grace of God into the the obedient, mature believers that that the Lord has sent us. 
to minister to. So tomorrow morning, <clears throat> I'm leaving for Kenya. I may bring you an, a final teaching before I go. I'll be gone until uh, through November 1st. So I'll check back with you from time to time, maybe bring you a greeting or some testimony, but my regular teaching will probably not take place until I get back again. So may the Lord bless and keep you. Please pray for me while I'm away in Africa. God bless.